Welcome to Taxidermy Truths, where we discuss the ins and outs of not only the taxidermy process, but the influences on the hunting community as a whole. With over 25 years in the wildlife and taxidermy industry, I host open conversations with artists, experts, and industry giants. From sustainable utilization to shipping rates, we dig into the reality of the experience after the safari and hear real stories worth remembering. Hi there, my name is Douglas Cocroft and welcome to Taxidermy Truths. Joining me today is Julian Keat. Julian is the head of digital design at Splitting Image Taxidermy and, and has a, an absolute passion for digital art, design and creativity. Recently, we had the, the brainwave idea to do a social experiment at Splitting Image Taxidermy. The question was, what does it take to train and create a taxidermist? So while hunters from across the globe choose taxidermists for a number of reasons, it's often hard to explain what it takes to create beautiful, anatomically correct taxidermy. So in the industry today, you've got mannequins and tanneries and commercial supply companies that supply eyes and glues and preset noses and a pose this way, a pose that way for the mannequin. It's become modular. But what does it take to train the artist? There's that saying, it's not the tool it's the fool behind the tool that matters. In taxidermy, it couldn't be more true. So as a way of trying to get to the bottom of this and unpack it, we decided to try our own social experience. This experience and experiment involved Julian, who's joining me today. And, and we're going to just openly chat about his time as a new mounter. We took someone who has an art background, who's by no means unskilled. He's qualified. Um, I'll let you know how well qualified in a moment. And we let Julian loose on mounting a simple impala. Alongside him, a fully trained and seasoned taxidermist mounted the exact same pose. They both got given a skin, eyes, horns, mannequin, and a time frame. And I laugh because it was fun. It was wonderful to see two artists in their own right working side by side and seeing the difference in outcome. The one artist who has no formal education but has trained in the taxidermy studio on how to create beautiful taxidermy. The other artist, being a digital artist, is qualified in a traditional sense. And his traditional art training and art form, well, let's just say it's not as easy as it looks. So without further ado, Julian, thanks for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate the fact that you've been such a sport in, in this little experiment. I, I know that there's been a lot of, a lot of jabs from various, various staff members who've passed by while you were busy, um, <laughs> me included. Um, and before I go any further, a massive congratulations on what you've achieved in doing this because as much as it, it, the mount didn't turn out at the splitting image taxidermy standard of an artist who has trained and spent time doing it, what you did was actually quite impressive. Um, hands up. Um, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, I take my hat off to you. Um, Julian, a little bit about yourself. We, we had chatted previously. Your background in art, what did you study? Um, what, what, please, and just in a nutshell, what exactly is digital design? So I studied a Bachelor's of Visual Arts um, at Nelson Mandela University. 
Um, I majored in graphic design and photography. So, um, yeah, I've always been creative and um, got connected with, with the right people at the right time. And at the time, while I was studying, um, my love grew for digital art, um, visual communication to people. And um, that sparked the whole creative journey for me. Awesome. Yeah. And it's not quite taxi to music. Very different, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult explaining to people um, what your role is within a taxidermy, because people think you pulling the skin on or shaving the mannequin, but where does a digital artist fit in that field? Uh, not a lot of people can see where your role comes in. Obviously with photography and that it's much different because all the, the beautiful mounts and trophies we create it needs to be photographed a specific way because it's all about how the client sees and views the work. You're creating perspective. Those photographs, unfortunately with, with technology today, um, photographs alter the appearance. And our goal is to photograph things as they stand. Um, yeah, it, it's a portrayal of our art form. Um, so and <laughs> how did it feel when, when we turned around and said, right, Julian, you're about to delve into the world of taxidermy and actually mount an animal? Yeah, it was quite a challenge because never did I really think that I would take on a challenge like that. But it was very interesting. Like, just the whole experience and being able to, to do it physically. Obviously, filming it, seeing it happen in the studio, it always looks easier than... You, you always think, ah, oh, I should be able to do something like that. But once you, you get your hands dirty and you, you, you actually like start the process, you actually realize how many different art forms it takes just to complete a mount. One animal. One animal. So for example, like you've got sculpting and shaving down the mannequin, um, that's an art form on its own. Then you got like uh, stitching, for example, stitching the, the skin, the skin together. together, that's an art form. I mean, you, you stitched one of the most difficult animals there are to stitch, believe it or not, as simple as an impala is. Yeah. An impala's hair follicle is dead straight. So when you try and mat it together, invariably, it stands up. So it, it's quite a difficult animal to stitch well. Yes. Um, you learned firsthand. Yeah. <laughs> and the only way you can master that technique is by doing. Yes. So that, that was so interesting. So as mentioned, walking around the studio, seeing all the mounts, you would, you would think, ah, oh, it's simple, it's easy, it's straightforward. You just take the shaver and you shave down the mannequin or take the saw and shape it in the pose, easy peasy. But once you're in that environment, you don't know how that tool actually works with, you, it, you need to like find your, your niche, you need to practice. I, I often like this, the, the art form of taxidermy, it's very similar, funnily enough, to cooking. There's a recipe. So, we've all watched these reality shows where Master Chef and these, you get these amazing cooks, chefs, kitchen technicians, whatever you want to call them. They have what looks like such a relatively simple recipe. And I've done it myself. I think, oh man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and cook this leg of lamb or this piece of meat. And you go and watch a YouTube video of this guy showing you how easy it is to cook this piece of meat and he, he slices it and it's moist and it's hot and your, your mouth salivates. When it comes to it, it looks like a tsunami has gone off in my kitchen because there's, there's just, to put it together, and at the end of it, I kind of look at that photograph of what it's supposed to look like yeah. and what it does look like. Completely different. Fortunately, by then, it's taken longer than I thought, and I'm so hungry, I could eat the cutting board. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think this is very similar. Um, training a taxidermy is not merely about putting the pieces of the puzzle together putting the skin to the mannequin, the eyes on the mannequin, and just stitching it up. 
it's understanding how each piece fits into the next and what will happen when it dries and what the outcome is. Um, if you do have a chance as a viewer to go and watch the, the video on the Splitting Image Taxidermy YouTube channel, um, on the Taxidermy Challenge, you'll see Julian and his incredible skill as a taxidermist. Um, one of the points that, that you might pick up is the ears on Julian's Impala. Um, Julian? Something. I knew question was going to come. Oh, you knew it was coming. I knew. <laughs> it had to. I mean, your Impala's ear looked like it had been attacked by a swarm of bees. <laughs> come on, dude. Yeah. You, you've, you've seen guys do it. Surely it's just a case of shaping and forming an ear. Um, how did that go down? Again, as mentioned, like my skill and knowledge with taxidermy is zero. I had no idea what I was doing. And the body filler that I was using, I used too much of the one part and it set very quickly. Immediately when I stuffed my ears, it, it literally started setting. So you would see in that video where I actually take a hammer and hammer the ear just so that it looks like an ear. an ear. Most people said it looked like a spoon, but close enough. Spoon, shovel, yeah. spearhead. There, there's, there's, there were a number of comments along the way. Exactly. Um, I tease you about this, and, and I'll, I'll say this in, on video, on record. I can remember the first animal I mounted. It was quite a while back. I was given a beautiful bush buck. Fantastic skin, it had a bit of bullet damage, I had to put it back together again. I naturally understand the anatomy of a bushbuck and how they move and I have a, a love for a bushbuck. Julian, I successfully turned a perfectly good bushbuck into something that was far closer to a bush pig. It was horrendous. The ears, they looked like two balloons. They looked like Shrek's ears. The nose was wrong. The eye setting was too far back. The horns were too far forward. And the skin just didn't seem to line up. It was a real mess. <laughs> but that's the starting point of learning how to become a taxidermist. The errors in taxidermy build you up. Exactly. You know, um, you've been fortunate enough to spend time around artists in the studios and seeing how they, how they evolve, the artwork that's evolved, and it, the artwork has evolved incredibly. Um, taxidermy as an art form has, invo has evolved. It, it's, becoming, it's becoming more and more accurate. And the expectation for accuracy is higher than ever. And as a result, it takes, on average, 12 to 18 months to take someone from Julian's novice entry level to someone who is proficient enough to mount and complete a piece of taxidermy that is of an acceptable standard, that the animal is respected, and the client's investment in that piece of artwork is safe. 18 months, I would say personally, at shortest. And that's for standard animals. A buffalo shoulder mount, a, a kudu shoulder mount, an impala shoulder mount. Yes, that's not even like a cat or there we go. something, some species that's- or something dynamic. Yeah, very dynamic and difficult yeah. to do, yeah. So, so look at a, a lion engaging in a sable combination mount movement, having to alter the mannequins. Julian, if I'd given you that piece, you'd still be there now. Oh, I wouldn't know where to start. But the hammer would be involved yeah. in the whole process again as well. Yes, but it, but it wouldn't be for a positive outcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> break down the exactly. <laughs> now, now, you were mounting next door to Muna. 
Yes. Mona's father started with me in the taxidermy industry probably 17 years ago. He's, I've known him since he was a young man. I've known him since he was a child and he's worked with me and he's now a, a, a young man in the business, but has exceptional talent. Yes. But he's been exposed to so much taxidermy and so much mounting that he's learned on the go. That being said, while you were busy there with your piece of art, looking across at Muna, did it suddenly become evident how good he is? Definitely. And one thing that stood out, he was very passionate with what, everything that he was tackling at that time. He was, he was loving it. It's not just doing it, get the client's work done. It's, it's a passion of his. It's a, he's a professional. And learning from a professional, I mean, that's anybody's dream to, sure. to get knowledge from somebody that's actually love what they do, first of all, and actually, you can say, is really good with what they're doing. So in that sense, it was, it was quite admiring seeing him work. And he worked very fast. Very quick. And it, it, for me to like steal with my eyes and do, there was, there was no, no time. time, no time. There's no time. Yeah. Um, what, one of his strengths is he has the ability to learn once and apply quickly. Yes. He, he's very good at the learning curve. Um, he's probably, if I, I do the, the basic sums in my head, he's probably mounted in the vicinity of about, I'd say, I would go as far as saying almost 2,000 animals. So again, this lends into that point that it takes time to create, to create that artist, to bring it out. Muna is an incredible artist inside, but he needs to learn how to do it. He needs to create the muscle memory. I'll tell you right now, Julian, if I put you onto a, a program for six to eight months, you would be mounting fluidly. After 18 months, I could create a tremendous artist out of you, a taxidermist. Yes. So you've also got to consider the dedication to the art form. You were attracted to visual arts, <clears throat> excuse me, attracted to the visual arts. So you went and studied traditional tertiary education. And you're now applying your art form in splitting image taxidermy, uh, doing content content creation, media creation, design, apparel design, etc., etc. There's a lot to be said for the guys that are committed to the art form of taxidermy. Because that's what excites them. Yes. You just said it, he was passionate about what he was doing. So as much as we are capable of training taxidermists, we do have to ask the question, is that the art form that they would choose and are they willing to dedicate and commit the time it takes to get to the levels that Munna and so many of our artists in the taxidermy studio have achieved? Could you see yourself as a pure taxidermist? No. It's not something I'm attracted to. It's not your choice. It's not my choice, no. So in saying that, Finding a, a candidate to train as a taxidermist means we need to find somebody that not only has the aptitude for art, symmetry, design, that not only has a passion for wildlife, but also wants to apply it to the art of taxidermy itself. I know I could train you to become an exceptional taxidermist, I have no doubt, but I know you'd be a far better digital designer because you are passionate about it. Exactly. And, and something interesting that I've also, also noticed throughout this whole process is just how you can see what he's passionate about because he, he does that very fast. On so the mount on the mount itself. Okay. So you, it's so interesting because he, 
he afterwards, him and I, we spoke a bit, and he told me what he actually enjoy about taxidermy, and that is that is so unique. Like within this whole creative space, and this cap for him to be able to to mount it is exceptional. But there's certain forms of art within that which which he enjoys, because not all art you would enjoy. Absolutely, some of it is a task. Exactly, but there's certain things that you really, really enjoy. Can you remember? Uh, <laughs> I can't okay. remember. I think I think shaping was one of it. Shaping the mannequin. He, he does have, have an affinity to sculpting. The, yeah, to right. sculpting it, and um, there was there was something else, eyes. but I can't remember. I it, think the eyes. I think yeah. It's the eyes. Yeah. He, he loves getting the set of the eyes right. Yes. And the ability to stand back from his piece. Exactly. And that animal looks into the room. Definitely. And it, and he's good at it. Yeah. Um, and that brings the mound to life. Is it does. It just, it just works, yeah. It does. Um, the social experiment didn't end with just the mount. Obviously, it had to be finished. And this, this is the point where you put the touches on and you seal the stitching and the coloring and the paint. And you apply the, the touches that bring that piece of art to life. Um, how was that side of the experience? I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it was very finicky and very detailed. And it's it's not like something that you can get away with. If you make yes. a mistake, the mistake is there. And it's going to stare you in the eye. And you need to make deal with what you've done. So after I've mounted my mount, and I heard all the comments of the spoon ears, the shovel ears, and my horns were set backwards, so it was the fastest Impala that was ever. It was running so fast, it, yeah. its horns folded back. So after hearing all these comments and going back and finishing the mount, already you like in a mindset, like there's no way I can like redeem myself <laughs> with this. There's no redemption. But still doing it, so much respect for the artist who's able to create a lifelike animal like that. And the attention to detail is, it's difficult to explain because you need to do it yourself. You need to understand how the color works, each species color and, how, and where to paint and put that color. It's not just taking a brush and putting it on. It's, it's, it's actually understanding the art on its own that this color goes there, that color goes there, this is good for eyes, this is good for ears, this is good for the nose. Understanding that is so interesting. And it turns out that brown is not actually just brown. Exactly. And the brown on the top is going to be a different shade of brown to the bottom. So you need to constantly... It was Stephanie who, who did the finishing of Muna's yes. impala, am I correct? That's correct, yeah. Look, she's got some, she's got a lot of experience. A lot of experience, um, yeah. She was very helpful. Really? She's, she saw that I was, I was drowning and right. she helped me. <laughs> Where Muna was like, you are, you, you're on your own. Sorry, dude. Like, I'm not going to help the, you. The cold, <laughs> like, heartless cold, heartless. And I kept asking, come on, man. Like, give me something. And it's like, sorry. But own. Steffi, she just wanted to help me. Like, she said, do this, do this. No, what are you doing now? So she was very kind and, and very helpful in that way, which helped me a lot to achieve what I've done. Look, again, you, you have done something special. Honestly, yeah. and I know you look at it and you, you're kind of going, wow. Um, but because you've filmed so many of the other artists and you've actually got a good understanding and you've been exposed to it for, for a number of years now, yeah. The fact that doing it yourself is still so difficult, it keeps on telling us the same thing. It takes time to train a taxidermist. It's not the case of picking someone up off the street and saying, right, start mounting, now you're a taxidermist, you're A for away. It's now a case of saying, here's the right personality, has the ability, 
wants to do it. It's a big thing. If you want to do something, invariably you do better at it. The fact that you wanted to do this meant that you actually achieved it. That was very key. You were, and, and that's what's made it such an incredible experience. Um, to the point, we're actually gonna do this more and create these taxidermy challenges with people from other industries, from within the hunting industry. I'd love to get a professional hunter to come and mount an animal alongside one of our taxidermists because a professional hunter has incredible insight into the animal itself. Yet I sometimes question whether they realize how much art and ability and passion goes into creating beautiful art forms. Yeah. Julian Keat, I couldn't be more grateful. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for making this possible. Um, Again, please go and check the website out and watch what Julian does on the Simpala in the Taxidermy Challenge. Um, it's an incredible privilege to be able to work with creatives in other fields, people who've committed their lives to studying other art forms. Taxidermy is an amazing art form, but as Julian rightly said, there are so many smaller art forms within the art form itself. Um, I believe that this little time we've spent and this Impala and I'm hoping that this, it, it brings recognition to the journey that the artist taxidermist goes through. Because it's not just a click and play. As much as I would love to find a small secluded town in the middle of nowhere that happens to breed the most spectacular taxidermists that are ready to just pick up and employ. This is not Charlie in the chocolate factory with Oompa Loompas that jump out of chocolate streams. It, it, it's, it's not a fairy tale. Finding an artist is, it's a challenge because these are people that are rare. They have a passion for wildlife. They have a passion for their art form. I have huge respect for any art form, but as a, a diehard, passionate taxidermist, I have an immense amount of respect for every taxidermist who, who brings their art form to life in these animals. Um, it's quite incredible. Julian, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, don't think you've got off the hook. No. You will be joining us in, in other adventures and other challenges. Um, the next one, I'm hoping that you're going to be behind the camera and you get to give, give some back that the guys gave to you. Um, congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it tremendously. Thanks for watching. This is Taxidermy Truths. Please feel free to follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, Splitting Image Taxidermy has always stood behind the creativity of taxidermy. Um, and as always, creating moments and taxidermy that are worth remembering. We look forward to chatting again, and uh, I hope that you enjoy this taxidermy social experiment. <laughs>